I'd been invited to my cousin's birthday party and as usual, my mum insisted I be on my best behaviour. Being at the age I was I naturally said I would be, but in reality, I took every opportunity to act the fool, tease the girls and play fight with the boys regardless of whether they wanted to or not. I'd gone too far and made a few of the other children cry by flicking cake and jelly at them using a plastic spoon. Mum grabbed my arm and smacked me as hard as she could on the back of my legs, however, this did little to calm my boisterous mood. Mum went to smack me again but Aunt Susan intervened saying, smacking Peter will only make him worse, let me show you an alternative. Please do. Replied Mum, I'm at the end of my tether with him I really am. She added as Aunt Susan grabbed my arm and led me up the stairs, followed by my mother. What are you doing? I shouted as I tried to struggle free. We're going to calm you down, then you can rejoin the party. Aunt Susan replied as she opened the spare bedroom door and led me inside. If you don't calm down, you don't rejoin the party, do you understand? I was a little afraid of her at this point, mainly because she was so calm, I nodded. Good. She said. Now, please remove all that clothing you have just messed up. She asked. I blushed and refused. Well, if you don't your mother and I will, so what's it going to be? She asked. But why do I have to? I asked. Because you're getting too boisterous and you're upsetting the others, you've got bits of cake and jelly on your trousers and jumper so you need some clean clothes on. Aunt Susan explained, as calm as ever. You are at a party after all and it's important that you look nice and clean. Oh, he's always messy. Added mum, maybe we should just leave and I'll give him the hiding of a lifetime when we get home. She suggested. No. Replied Aunt Susan. There'll be no more smacking, just trust me on this one, she turned back to me and said, so, are you going to get undressed or are we going to have to do it for you? I thought for a moment, before saying, but I've got nothing to change into. Well, I'll find you something. She replied, plus, the sooner you get changed the sooner you can go back to the party and have some fun, okay. I conceded and removed my jumper. T-shirt and trousers as well. Aunt Susan insisted. I shyly did as asked until I sat in only my underpants and socks. And your pants and socks. She said. I haven't got all day. All the time mum stood silently by the closed door. But why? I moaned, they haven't got food on them. Because I said so young man. Aunt Susan replied. Now, pants and socks. Nervously I removed my socks, followed by my underpants and sat on the edge of the bed. Aunt Susan turned to my mother and said. Right, we're almost done. Shall we go and find him some clean clothes to wear? Mum gave me a disapproving look as I sat on the bed, before exiting the spare room with my aunt and leaving me alone for a moment. Before long mum returned and said, Right Peter, as soon as you're dressed you can go back to the party and play past the parcel with the other children okay. I nodded but barely looked up at her, instead of staying focused on my feet and the floorboards around them. Good, now let's get you dressed replied mum. Knickers and vest first. I'm not wearing them. I protested as I looked up to see the pair of frilly knickers which mum was passing to me, they're girls. Yes, they are. Replied mum dryly, and yes, you are. Nobody is going to see them Peter so nobody will know that you're wearing girls knickers unless of course, you start acting the fool again. She looked straight at me. At which point I'll pull them down in front of everyone and smack your bottom. Do you understand? She asked. Sulking the biggest sulk I'd ever sulked, I nodded. Good. She replied. Now arms up. She instructed, before slipping the girl's vest onto my arms and pulling it down over my body. Very pretty. She said, smiling. Is he ready yet? I heard Aunt Susan call from the hallway. Yes. Replied Mum, turning towards the door. Aunt Susan entered holding a coat hanger upon which hung a girl's dress, I'm sure this one will fit him. She said as she entered. Fortunately for you Peter it's blue, 
so it's perfect for a boy. I can't wear that. I pleaded, almost in tears. Everybody will make fun of me. No, they won't. Replied Aunt Susan, passing my mother the hanger and saying, I'll go and have a word with the other children so they won't tease him. She paused before turning her attention back to me. Although I don't see why I should seeing as you've been teasing them all day. She said sternly, before, placing a pair of girl's shoes and some white socks next to me on the bed, then closing the door behind her and leaving me and mum alone. Mum removed the dress from the hanger and laid it on the bed next to me and began unfastening the buttons. I'm sure you'll be far less interested in being the centre of attention now. She said as she held it up for me. Although wearing such a pretty dress, you're sure to be the centre of attention. Mum added with glee. Now stand up and turn around please. But please mum. I pleaded, I promise I'll be good. Please don't make me wear a dress. Mum sighed a long audible sigh before saying, well, you can go back to the party in your frilly knickers and lacy vest if you like, or you can wear this dress over them. It's up to you. I began to cry. Oh look. Said mum unsympathetically. He's crying just like a little girl. Now, do you want to wear the dress or do you want to go downstairs in your knickers? She asked. Sniveling I replied, the dress. Please. Instructed mum. Please, I murmured. Good. Replied mum. Now stand up and turn around so I can fasten you into it. I did as I was told. Arms up. She said, before slipping the dress over my head and pulling it down over my body. She then began fastening up the long row of buttons which went all the way up its back. I looked down at the blue satin dress with its ribbons and frills as mum fastened me into it. I realised just how stupid I must look. I began to cry again. What's wrong now? Asked mum impatiently. I look stupid. No you don't, you look very pretty. She replied as she fastened the final button behind my neck. She turned me around to face her and tied two of the ribbons into a bow beneath the white lace-edged collar. Perfect. She said. Now you sit down and I'll put your shoes and socks on. I sat on the edge of the bed as mum rolled a white knee-length pop sock onto each foot, before fastening the black Mary Janes onto my feet. Now that's much better. She said as she knelt in front of me and looked me straight in the eye, right, if you act out of line even once, I'll smack your bottom in front of everybody and they'll all see your knickers. Do you understand? I nodded. Good, now wipe your eyes because you don't want them knowing you've been crying like a girl do you? I shook my head, before taking the tissue from my mum and wiping the tears from my eyes. Good. She said, before leading me down the stairs and back to the party. Everybody began giggling as I entered. Aunt Susan shushed them all with icy authority remember girls and boys what I said would happen if you laughed at Peter. She reminded them all. Shyly and silently I took my place at the table and, trying my best not to draw attention to myself, ate quietly whilst the others laughed and giggled amongst themselves. Afterwards, we played past the parcel, musical statues, pin the tail on the donkey and finally musical chairs. All the while I remained quiet and played along nicely. As I say, the last thing I want is any attention drawing to myself. I heard mum say to Aunt Susan how well her idea worked and how nice it was seeing me playing nicely instead of my usual boisterous way. After what seemed an age, the guests, one by one, began to leave. Right young man. You'd better get changed and give cousin Jenny her dress back, then we can go home. She said, still annoyed with my behaviour earlier. And make sure you say thank you to Aunt Susan and Jenny. Yes. I shyly nodded, eager to get my own clothes back. Mum grabbed my hand, which she never did usually, and led me to the dining room where Aunt Susan, Cousin Jenny, and the remaining guests were. Peter would like to say sorry for his behaviour earlier, wouldn't you Peter? She stated, drawing everybody's attention to me. I stood there trembling in my pretty blue dress, pop socks and shiny black Mary Janes. 
Nervously I stammered an apology before mum forced me to say thank you to Jenny for lending me her pretty dress to wear. Once mum had humiliated me enough, she said, well we'd better get this one changed so Jenny can have her dress back. Then we'll be off. At last. I thought, I'm finally going to get out of this thing. Mum turned me around and led me upstairs. Aunt Susan followed us out and caught us halfway up the stairs, in hushed tones she said to Mum, I didn't want to say in front of the others. She glanced at me, but I think it's a good idea if you keep hold of the dress. They both glanced at me. I stood silent, clasping my hands. Aunt Susan continued, if it's hanging in his wardrobe it'll be a good reminder of what the consequences of his boisterous behaviour are, don't you think? Mum turned to me again, pulled a concerned expression and said, hum. Well, it is a very pretty dress and I'm sure it wasn't cheap Susan. Oh don't worry about that. Aunt Susan interrupted. It's too small for Jenny anyway she glanced from the dress to the shoes I wore. And those shoes are old ones too, she added. Mum turned back to her sister, oh well, in that case, thank you. She smiled, I'm sure they'll come in handy knowing this one, before turning back to me and prompting me to say thank you too. Revelations of this dress sitting in my wardrobe flooded through my mind. All I wanted was to get out of the damn thing once and for all and now we're bringing it home. Mum said my name sternly. I jerked back into reality, Peter, she repeated, say thank you to Aunt Susan for letting you keep Jenny's dress. She insisted. Thank you, Aunt Jenny. I obediently stammered, before edging towards the bedroom where I got changed all those hours before. And where are you going? Asked Mum sharply. Ta-ta to get changed. I muttered. Well there's no need now is there? You wait at the bottom of the stairs and I'll get your things. She instructed. I hesitated, obviously wanting to change first. Now. Mum barked. You may as well wear it until bedtime, seeing as you look nice for a change. I sulked my way down the stairs and waited at the door. Mum and Aunt Jenny spent a few moments bagging my own clothes before they reappeared on the landing. Thanks again, Susan. Said Mum as she made her way down the stairs. You've worked wonders today. She added with a smile. Anything is better than smacking Aunt Susan replied. Now you are going to be a good boy from now on aren't you Peter? I nodded. Good. She said. I think we've proved today that you can be very polite and well-mannered, let's try to make sure such good behaviour is possible when you're not wearing a pretty dress shall we? Yes, auntie. I shyly replied. I felt so self-conscious as we left the house and headed for the car. The wind whipped up my dress and I feared it would blow up. Mum sat me on the back seat and fastened my seatbelt, before straightening my dress over my lap. It's very nice of Aunt Susan giving you this isn't it? I didn't reply. On the journey home I just looked out of the window, but my stare kept shifting to my knees poking out beneath the dress. M.Y. Dress. As soon as we arrived home I asked Mum if I could get changed, to which she flatly refused. No dear, you can watch TV until bath time, then you can get ready for bed. But. No buts. Or you'll be going to school wearing your new dress if you're not careful young man, she snapped. Do you understand? Yes. I sulked, not wanting to be seen wearing a girl's dress at any cost. Good, Mum replied. I sulked in silence as bath time approached. Before long, Mum ushered me to my room and helped me out of the dress. Now be careful taking your pop socks off, they're very delicate, she advised as I sat on the edge of my bed in the lacy white vest and knickers I'd worn all day. Mum hung the dress in my wardrobe and made several comments about how nice it was seeing me a, behave myself and b, look so pretty. She ran me a bath. On her return she placed a folded item of clothing on my bed. A folded pink item I may add. What's that? I asked, or protested to be more precise. Auntie Susan very kindly gave you a pair of Jenny's old gym jams too. What? I protested. I'm not wearing girls' pyjamas. 
Oh yes, you are young man. Mum snapped, if Aunt Susan is kind enough to give them to you, then you should be polite enough to be thankful and wear them. And remember, from now on, any back chat from you and I'll send you to school in your new dress. Do you understand? Sulking, I nodded. Good, now put your dirty clothes into the laundry and get in the bath. I want you in these gym jams and downstairs in 15 minutes. She instructed. After my bath I returned to my bedroom to find, now neatly laid out on my bed rather than folded, the pyjamas Aunt Susan had also given me. Why me? I moaned as I pulled the top on. It was baby pink with little puffed sleeves and lace edging. It had flower-shaped buttons up the front and a little ruffled collar. The bottoms were shorts rather than pants like my own pyjamas. They had an elasticated waist, a little bow at the front and lace edges around the legs. Not wanting to risk being sent to school in a dress, I reluctantly went downstairs as instructed. I quickly entered the sitting room, sat down on the sofa and pulled a cushion over me to hide behind. Let's have a look at your new gym jams. Mum insisted. They're horrible. I replied, not moving from behind the cushion. Peter. She said sternly. Do I have to? Yes you do, now stand up and let me see. As instructed, I removed the cushion and stood up. Oh very pretty. Mum gushed. Turn around. She insisted. Oh very nice, aren't you lucky? I sulked. Don't you like them? No. They're silly. I snapped. Why are they silly? Mum asked. They are lovely. She insisted. They're for girls. Well, those are for you, Peter. Mum snapped back. So you'd better get used to them. Defeated, I chose not to respond. I just stood there in my short pink pyjamas, as if awaiting further instruction. Mum looked me up and down again before saying. Well, you'd better run along to bed. And do not change into your old pyjamas or I'll be cross. She instructed. I hung my head. The thought had crossed my mind. Do you understand? Yes, I replied. Good, now run along. Before I turned my light out I noticed the girls' shoes I'd worn today on my shoe rack next to my school shoes. They were horrid, and hard to walk in I reminisced. I was glad today was over I thought as I turned out my light. I thumbed the lace edging of my pyjama shorts as I drifted off to sleep. This week on Weekend Woman's Hour, we talk to Denise and Robert Matthews, a couple who've completely reversed their traditional roles. Denise works full-time as an estate agent whilst husband Robert works full-time at home doing the laundry and ironing, cleaning, gardening, grocery shopping, cooking, washing up. Everything presenter Janine Murphy introduced. Now, Denise. Can you talk us through a typical working day? Of course Janine, and hello, Denise replied. I get up around 6.30, 7am and have a quick shower before breakfast, which Robert has lovingly prepared for me. He straightens the bed and gives the bathroom a once-over before laying out my clothes for the day. He chooses your clothes. Janine quizzed. Oh no, not at all, Denise said. I tell him what I'll be wearing and he'll lay it out and whilst I'm dressing, his clearing up the breakfast dishes and preparing my packed lunch, she goes on to describe him handing her case and coat, seeing her off, briefly explains her working day which ends at 5pm. I return home to a cooked dinner and we dine together, and whilst Robert's clearing the table, cleaning the kitchen, and washing the dishes, I'll either catch up on some paperwork or put my feet up in front of the TV. And Robert. 
What's your typical day like? Janine asked. Hello, Robert said. My typical day begins around 6 a.m. I'll have a quick shower before giving the bathroom a once over, then I'll tidy up downstairs, polish Denise's shoes, give her jacket a brush down, and prepare breakfast. Then I'll straighten the bed, tidy the bathroom, lay out her clothes, tidy the kitchen, wash the breakfast dishes, make her sandwiches and see her off, he explained. I'll decide what we'll be having for the evening meal and either take something out of the freezer and or prepare a shopping list. I'll set my hair before the work really starts, dusting, polishing, vacuuming, laundry, ironing, grocery shopping. The more I can get done in the mornings the better. I'll have a light lunch and time permitting, I'll grab an afternoon nap before making sure the house is absolutely spotless before Denise returns. I'll put the tea on and dress for dinner, we'll dine and then I'll clear up and clean the kitchen. If Denise is doing paperwork I'll occupy myself with some ironing or organising or we might watch some TV together until around 10pm when I'll turn in. So you're busy? Janine asked. Yes, Robert replied. Now, being a radio show. Our listeners can't see Robert or Denise, but could you describe what you're wearing today Robert? Janine asked. Eh. Uh, of course. Robert hesitantly replied. He described a powder purple sleeveless dress, knee length, with a peppering of large lilac spots. It's a lovely dress. Janine complimented, before informing the viewers that his hair and makeup are both immaculate, and adding that he also wears a pair of patent black court shoes with a modest three-inch heel and thin new tights. They're actually stockings, Denise added. Proper ones, not hold-ups. Now. I can't imagine you doing the housework in such a nice frock. Janine the presenter stated. No. Robert bashfully replied. This is how I'd dress for dinner, he said, before describing his housekeeping attire which consists of a plain frock and apron. What colour? Well the apron's white and I have a few housekeeping frocks, black, grey, duck egg, and burgundy, Robert replied. Do you have a favourite? Not really. They're practical clothes, Robert replied, before saying that he's not keen on the duck egg frock because it feels like something a dental nurse might wear. And heels. Do you find those practical for housework? I didn't to begin with but like all things, one soon becomes accustomed to them. You mentioned setting your hair. Ah, uh, yes. Robert replied. I think that's the biggest learning curve I've had since becoming a house husband. It was quite a hurdle wasn't it, his wife interjected. My grandmother, who was a traditional housewife, always told me that one must tend to themselves before they can tend to the home, she explained. But things have changed so much since my grandmother's day. Women are the workers and men tend to stay at home these days. But there's still the stigma that housework is woman's work and we all know the mantra. Woman's work means woman's wear. Janine and Denise said in unison, before proudly chuckling. After seeing his wife off to work, Robert spends a good hour putting his hair in rollers and applying his makeup before getting on with his chores and doing the grocery shopping. At first I felt very self-conscious leaving the house wearing rollers and a hairnet, but people can think what they like. I want to look nice when Denise gets home from work and Denise likes me looking my best. Robert explained. Do you envy other house husbands who don't have to go through the daily rigmarole of doing their hair and makeup? Janine asked, adding, it must be a bit of a chore. Life is full of chores. Robert chuckled. But yes, at first I really did resent it. My hair wasn't long enough to do much with so it was just learning to apply my makeup properly and getting used to wearing a frock and heels. It helped you focus though, his wife interjected. Before I put you in a frock you were constantly chasing your tail, trying to keep on top of everything but once he was dressed the part and we revised his cleaning rotor, things really fell into place. Hmm. Robert agreed. Obviously I was dead against wearing a frock. Domestic dresses aren't very flattering but they do focus the mind. The sooner I've completed my chores the sooner I could take it off. He said. 
And what did your friends and extended family say after you'd taken on the domestic role and allowed yourself to be feminized? Janine asked. Well. Robert began. A lot of things, he nervously replied. Some were positive but most seemed to think I was under the thumb and being taken advantage of, but the important thing to focus on is not what people think or say but how our marriage works. It's a partnership. Denise brings in the money that pays for the roof over my head and the food in my belly and I provide a clean and tidy home and prepare the food when she gets home from work. We both work very hard to achieve what we've got and we wouldn't have it any other way. But. Wouldn't you rather things be the way they used to be, when men provided and the women cooked and tidied? And work too. Denise interjected. Janine agreed. Robert replied. If I could earn as much as Denise does and Denise was more domestically minded, then that could work. But the world isn't like that anymore. Generally speaking, Males aren't the best at multitasking so we're all better off focusing on what we're good at rather than sticking to traditional roles. In my case, that's following a set routine and doing one chore at a time and in Denise's it's managing a large portfolio of clients, he said. I certainly couldn't do what she does and she's no desire to do what I do, he shrugged. So Denise, Janine said. How do you react when people say he's under the thumb or being taken advantage of? I tell them he's my husband and I'll treat him as I damn well please, she replied, somewhat jovially. More seriously, however, she explains that people don't really have a problem with him being a house husband, but some do have a problem with him being a feminized house husband. I think people dwell too much on gender. I'm not a fan of the woman's work means woman's wear mantra. I've never considered housework to be women's work. It's just housework and the person who does it is the housekeeper and housekeeper have worn a certain style of clothing since the Victorian era. Just because most housekeepers these days are husbands shouldn't mean they can't dress as a housekeeper should. Janine responded. A high heel's really practical for housework though. They mean he doesn't have to reach quite so high with the feather duster. Denise grinned. When he's doing the cornices, she added. She glanced at her husband's feet. They may not be practical but they're not impractical either, she claimed. You haven't gone over on them yet, have you hon? she asked. Uh, no. Robert replied, albeit somewhat hesitantly. Been close a few times but, respect the heel and they'll respect you, he said. My mother used to say that, Janine exclaimed before describing how her mother wore high heels all the time whilst Janine herself stuck to flats her entire life. It's interesting isn't it though? When you think that Louis XIV popularized high heels and cosmetics, fashions which, a hundred years later became exclusive to women, are now going full circle and back to where they began. Absolutely, Denise replied. I've explained to Robert countless times how the pendulum swings one way then the other. And right now we're at the moment the pendulum stops and swings the other way. Women used to be subservient to males simply because they didn't have the earning potential. They were expected to clean the house and prettify themselves, to be obedient, loyal, dutiful whilst hubby went to the office then played golf. Now the males don't have the earning potential it is their turn to do exactly what's expected of the subservient partner. So. That's all good and well for a couple such as yourselves. Janine responded. But what about same-sex partnerships? I said subservient partner for a reason Janine. Denise confidently replied. As I said earlier, most partnerships have one who earns more than the other, and the same goes for gay, lesbian, and even trans couples. One earns the money, the other earns their keep, she bluntly stated. Janine grinned. She enjoyed her guest's jovial bluntness but couldn't help but wonder whether or not she's just a controlling misandrist and that Robert is well and truly under the thumb. So Robert, she said, turning to her other guest. What did you want to be when you were a boy, she asked. I can't imagine you grew up wanting to be a house husband. I'm not sure the phrase had even been coined when I was a boy, Robert replied, before timidly trying to answer the question. I want to be all sorts of things, cowboy, astronaut, racing driver, firefighter, ninja, he chuckled. But who knows? 
In years to come when everyone's dad is the housekeeper, boys may well grow up with that role as an aspiration. Janine replied, clearly not convinced with Robert's last suggestion. Really? Let's not forget Janine that when our mothers and grandmothers were little girls, they had dreams of being a princess and wanted nothing more than to find a prince, live in a castle, and wear beautiful dresses. True but. These days girls have so much more to aspire to, Janine replied. We do. Denise agreed. And as I stated earlier, the pendulum is swinging. We're already seeing males taking on the domestic roles, donning their domestic clothes and even prettifying themselves. Yes but. So far as I can make out, not through choice, Janine said. It's through necessity. One partner provides the money, the other provides the labor. Denise reiterated. After a long day in the office, I want to come home to a nice clean house in which I can kick my shoes off and relax. I want the aroma of a home-cooked meal and a husband who doesn't look like he's spent all day cleaning, she said. There's nothing worse than coming home to a husband with tatty hair and a dirty apron who's frantically finishing off the hoovering and still needs to clean the kitchen before even starting on dinner, she added. I can just picture the scene. Janine chuckled. And does that ever happen Robert, she asked. Uh, um. Ha ha. Robert nervously chuckled. It has, he admitted. When I was inexperienced. You keep on top of things these days don't you darling, his wife said. I try my best, Robert replied. He described the frantic last hour before his wife returns home when he's putting all the cleaning stuff away, giving the worktops one last wipe, quickly dusting a picture frame with his pinny before having a really close shave, applying his makeup, donning a dinner dress, removing his rollers and styling his hair. All in time for Denise to walk through the door. It sounds like a scene from a 1950s TV show, the perfect little housewife in heels and petticoats, with perfect makeup and not a hair out of place. Only you're the husband. Janine smiled, before telling the listeners that they're running out of time. Now I'm sure you're all dying to see what Robert's wearing, she enthused, so we're going to put a photo on the Weekend Woman's R page at bbc.com. And don't forget the podcast where you can hear the entire discussion with our guests. Denise and Robert, she informed the listeners. Denise and Robert. I thank you, she said. Thank you, Janine. It's been a pleasure, Denise added. Janine turned back to the microphone. Next week's Women's Are Drama will be the new adaptation of Peter Jackson's Conditions of Inheritance. In which a teenage boy is forced to become housemaid and servant to his domineering Aunt Agatha. Until then, goodbye. A male announcer's voice began. Weekend Woman's R was presented by Janine Murphy and produced by blah 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 blah. I turned off the radio and looked into Denise's eyes. Her expression bore a pursed smile. I think I came across as a bit of a dragon, she said. No. I insisted, although, at times, she did. The presenter was so patronizing toward me don't you think? I said. I'm sure you didn't want to grow up to be a mere house husband, I said, mimicking Janine Murphy's middle class radio for voice. She was, my wife replied. But they often are on woman's hour, she claimed. Are you going to download the podcast, she asked. I wasn't planning on it. Do you want me to? I said. Absolutely. Denise replied. They cut out the entire discussion about your birdcage. Thankfully. I don't want that being aired on national radio. I retorted. In fact, I wished you hadn't mentioned it in the first place. I moaned. If I didn't mention it she would have, Denise claimed. I thought she was staring at my cleavage until I noticed that she was also a keyholder, she told me. I glanced at the pendant that hangs around Denise's neck, a symbolic silver key denoting that my wife is my keyholder. The actual key to my chastity cage is kept somewhere safe, in a place unknown to me. I cast my mind back to last Tuesday when the Women's Hour interview was recorded. 
I'd never felt so ashamed in my whole life when Denise noticed the presenter's distinctive pendant and their excitable chat about the benefits of chastity that followed. In fact, thinking about it, it's no wonder they removed that section from the main broadcast. For a moment I hold some hope that it's been removed from the podcast too. Until I remember Janine's closing comment about their entire discussion being available. I only hope no one I know downloads it. I groaned. Loads of husbands are under lock and key Robert, Denise claimed. You're certainly not unique in that respect. So you keep saying, I replied. We'd just rather all and sundry didn't know about it. It's nothing to be ashamed of, she said. That's easy for her to say. My senior school, North West London, 60s, used the cane and slipper on both boys and girls. The school itself was not particularly strict in the terms of the time. In terms of the state schools that used corporal punishment at that period, it possibly tended to use this method rather more than others, such as detention, or lines. This simply because being less strict than, say, a typical girls' private school of the time, these methods were either ignored or were considered, and were, ineffective. I have had the experience of the reality, and effects of attendance at really strict schools with my daughter and stepdaughter who attended reasonably well-known UK private girls' schools relatively recently. Highlights, which I still view with disgust, included me, as an adult, being dressed down face to face by one of their housemistresses over one of them wearing a skirt to lessons which had acquired a few spots of paint or glue during practical lessons given by the school. This was when I could not possibly be aware as they were then boarding. The other incident is possibly more serious and in my view should have led to further action. However, it did not happen to either of my girls, but did to one of their friends. At one of the schools during winter and in an intermittent rainstorm, a teacher insisted that a girl standing outside the school waiting for her parents should remove the non-regulation raincoat she was wearing, as it was not approved uniform and wait as she got progressively wetter and colder. This was apparently a common occurrence. The official coats were very expensive and very unfashionable. The girls had literally to be forced to wear them, and the parents forced to buy them. Getting back to the treatment of boys and girls at UK schools I attended as a girl. At primary school the slipper was used for both, quite rarely, but typically in front of the class, and the cane very rarely but believed to be applied to both for serious offences. Boys tended to commit more serious offences than girls, although I seem to remember a theft by some older girls from the girls' cloakroom at one stage. I was aware of one slippering, a boy and a girl, which took place in the next-door classroom to hours for going out of school at playtime. I never saw the event although of course, we questioned them about it afterwards. Three on the bottom, bending over. The cane was mentioned once or twice in assembly for thefts and such, actually after the event and punishment now I think about it. These people have had the cane, and the matter is closed etc., but took place only in the headmaster's study. I was only vaguely aware at the time, and never knew anyone who got it, or admitted they had. All of us, girls and boys, at that time expected the cane was given on the bottom, like the slipper. I can't remember feeling in danger of getting other at primary school. Senior school was very different. This was a big North London school, actually, originally a secondary modern school at that time converting to a full comprehensive. The headmaster, we believed, had come from the boys' private school sector in the UK, which at that time according to my male friends and public record, used the cane extensively, including allowing older pupils such as prefects to beat younger boys. At this school, the cane was used for both boys and girls. The headmaster and male deputy head would regularly cane boys on the bottom, and the female deputy head would cane girls on the hand in her room. 
We girls could be caned for the same offences as the boys, smoking, truancy, offences relating to wearing of uniform, lateness, rudeness etc., and many of my classmates and other girls were caned over the period I was there. I managed to avoid it. On one occasion, however, I remember taking a record book for another teacher to the female deputy head's room and distinctly hearing one, older, girl getting six strokes of the cane as I waited outside the door. On more than one occasion at senior school, I also witnessed public canings of boys in assembly. These were for really serious offences, theft, bullying etc. The headmaster would announce that the school would wait behind after the final hymn. After the main part of the assembly, the head would then say that a serious matter had occurred and describe the offence, s. The whole school then witnessed the boy, or boys, being called out from the audience to the stage. The head would then say something about these boys are now going to be punished and either ask one of the other teachers, e.g. Deputy heads, on the stage to get the cane from the side of the stage or sometimes it was on the table in front of him. He would then take the cane and call the boy or one of the boys to the middle front of the stage, in the area in front of the table. The boy was then told to face the right hand, from our viewpoint, side of the stage and bend over. The head then ordered the boy to fold back his blazer and touch his toes. I remember the head usually put the cane across the boy's bottom and asked if he was ready. They always said yes. The head then proceeded to give them six of the best. It seemed to be always six. Afterwards, the head would put the cane back on the table, tell the boy to stand up, and send him to stand at the side of the stage. The head then said something like let that be a warning to you all before dismissing the school. During the proceedings, the school looked on in literally shocked silence. I don't remember any of the boys crying out to any degree, but I do remember hearing the sharp intakes of breath on each stroke and gasps for breath between. The swish of the cane and the impact on the boys' bottoms were very loud in the deathly silence. I found these occasions very stressful and fear-inducing. I remember on at least one occasion, girls near me bursting into tears as a caning proceeded. We generally felt sorry for the boys but were never actually sure whether it might not have been the same for us girls, but probably on the hands, if really bad offences had been committed. It was certainly a feared punishment, both as receiver and audience. I am certain that these very public events must have been officially recorded. In respect of the slipper at senior school. This seemed to be mostly associated with PE, gym, and games lessons. It did apply and was applied, fairly regularly to both boys and girls. Many of my girl and boy classmates got it on a semi-informal basis. A smaller, but significant number of both boys and girls were slippered officially and formally for known offences, usually in private, i.e. on their own or one at a time, either in a room next to the gym or in the gym itself. It had been a few of the cuter stuffed animals that had brought Miyuki into the store. She had not thought that it was a baby furniture place when she had walked in. She was disappointed to note that toys that had brought her into the store were not even for sale. She looked about, a little disappointed about the lack of anything she wanted to buy. Miyuki, in her blue pleated skirt, sailor blouse and yellow neck scarf all part of her school uniform did not really look like someone who would be shopping for baby furniture. At the back of the store the owner, an old woman, drowsed on the counter, hardly aware of her customer. Miyuki was about to leave when she heard a soft creak. Turning about she saw a door at the back of the store, partially open. She did not remember a door being there before, but maybe she had just missed it. Curious, though she should have known better, she walked over to the door, peeking around it, wondering what was behind it. She could see nothing. Suddenly, out of that nothing, came a hand. Miyuki jumped back slightly, a little shocked. 
The hand, she assumed that the arm and the rest of the body were just hidden by the darkness, made a beckoning motion to her. She moved closer. It spread its fingers. Again, Miyuki should have known better, but she reached out and took the hand. It gently clasped around hers, then suddenly yanked her into the darkness. Miyuki found herself falling. She let out a surprised scream, pushed her skirt down, it was threatening to blow up above her waist, and quietly wondered why these things always happened to her. She fell for a time, though she could tell she was not gaining speed, nor falling particularly fast. That was nice. Other times she had been in such a situation she had been sure she was to fall to her death. Though that had obviously never happened. With a suddenness that shocked her, the darkness was gone and she came to an abrupt stop, landing in a pile of stuffed animals. A number of teddy bears, kitties, puppies, and other toy animals shot into the air, then rained down upon her. Miyuki floundered around in the mountain of toys before finally righting herself and pulling herself free. She half slid, half rolled down the side until she came to the bottom, a hardwood floor. As she stood up she was perplexed to note that the pile of stuffed animals did not seem that high at all, coming up no farther than her waist. It was very odd. The room she was in was decorated in bright colours and fanciful murals covered the walls. She was turning around, looking at everything, chests of some sort, a small table and chairs, a few doors, when she came face to face with a woman. She was a very attractive woman with red hair and blue eyes. She wore something that looked like an old-fashioned nurse's outfit. Victorian, Miyuki's mind supplied her with an era. Good day young miss, the woman said in a warm voice. Ah, uh, um, Miyuki stuttered. Where am I? Your name young miss, the woman asked, not answering Miyuki's question. Ah, Miyuki. Miyuki, the woman said, reaching down to take her hand. Such a pretty name. Come along, she turned and started off, pulling Miyuki along with her. Wait. Miyuki said, already not liking things. Why did it seem things like that always happened to her? Where are we going? Come along, the woman said. Miyuki tried to resist, to break the woman's grip, but she could not. She has simply pulled along. They exited the playroom through one door and entered what looked like an infant's bedroom. The woman propelled Miyuki forward, into the arms of another woman, this one with black hair and brown eyes, dressed identically to the first. This is Miyuki, the first woman said. Hello Miyuki, the second said as she reached up and began to undo the yellow scarf around Miyuki's neck. Wait, Miyuki gasped, trying to bat the woman's hands away. Before she could put up any sort of concentrated effort she felt the first woman loosening items. From there it was something of a losing battle. As she reached around the try to keep the second woman from further removing items, the first woman suddenly pulled her arms, forcing them up. At the same time, clothing was taken off her. Before she could do anything about it, the woman began to dress her, in a quick, effective manner. Very quickly she stood in clothes that looked like a copy of her school uniform. A sailor suit with a very short skirt that showed off thick garments, marked with even cuter pandas. Miyuki was a little stunned as she looked at herself, looking over her shoulder to try to get a better idea of what she was wearing. Why? What? How? She began, more than a little confused. Perfect, the first woman said, admiring her handiwork. Yes. The second woman nodded. Now I think Miyuki should take a nap. Miyuki, who had long since learned that running was ultimately the best option in such situations, did just that. Her short skirt flipped up as she bolted for the door. It opened easily and she found herself in a hallway. Miyuki, one of the women said sharply. Get back in here now or you'll get a spanking. Someone help me. Miyuki yelled as she ran down the hall as fast as she could go. It seemed an impossibly long haul, with many doors on either side. Worried that she might be pursued, and of the threat of a spanking, Miyuki turned and tried one of the doors. It opened in her hand, presenting her with a bathing room. 
A woman dressed in only in an apron smiled at her. Time for your bath Miyuki, she said. Miyuki slammed the door and continued running down the hall. The place was mad, even worse than Wonderland, and that was saying a lot in her opinion. She was considering trying another door when she felt someone grab her and yank her into one of the rooms. If you're running like that, it can only mean one thing, a platinum blonde dressed like the first woman said as she swung Miyuki into the room. Here we go. With one smooth motion, she pushed her back onto what turned out to be a child's potty seat. It had a duck's head in front, with handles coming out either side. The woman put Miyuki's hands on this the handles then story. stepped back. This is how now just do your business Miyuki, she said sweetly. Miyuki discovered she could not let go of the handles. Neither could she stand up. Also, she suddenly felt the telltale pressures that she was indeed about to do her business. As the woman examined the garments she had removed from Miyuki, then praised her for keeping them dry and clean, nature took its course with Miyuki. She flushed a deep red. Good girl, the woman said pulling Miyuki forward. Her hands were still stuck to the handle. The woman produced some toilet paper and began to clean Miyuki up. Miyuki flushed deep red from her head to her toes. She decided that she much rather be involved in another game than what was happening. The woman finished and Miyuki found she could release the handles. Before she could do anything else, she found she was being put into a pair of training panties. Wait. I don't. Come along Miyuki, the woman said, grasping Miyuki and leading her to the sink. She slid around behind her and then helped, forced actually, her to wash her hands. Miyuki tried to fight, but it was useless. Good girl, the woman said, pushing Miyuki out the door. She directed Miyuki through another door, down some stairs, and into a kitchen. She directed her to a chair then pushed her down into it. Now you just wait there and I'll get your meal ready. For now you can have some juice. She put an infant's cup down on the table in front of Miyuki. I got to go, Miyuki said, getting out the chair and running for the door. Come back here young lady or there will be no dessert for you. Fine with me, Miyuki told her as she pushed open another door and found herself climbing a long flight of stairs. A door opened on one of the landings. A tall woman wearing a severe suit leaned out, behind her was a room that looked like a nursery school. Time for school young lady, she said. Maybe later, Miyuki called out as she avoided the woman and continued up the stairs. At another landing, a woman dressed more like a modern nurse stepped out of a door. I hear you are sick, she said, waving a rectal thermometer. I'm fine, Miyuki yelled, dodging the woman's grasp as she continued up the stairs. Finally the stairs ended. Just ahead of her was a door. I've got to get out of here, she cried, pushing the door open. She swung about and pushed the door closed behind her, leaning up against it, breathing hard, her eyes closed. I'm going to die, she said softly, gasping for breath. Miyuki, finally, she heard a voice. Her head snapped up, her eyes open. Standing in front of her was another woman, wearing the Victorian-style nurse's uniform, though she had a rubber apron over it. Ah, I better go, Miyuki said, reaching for the doorknob. The woman grabbed her by the arm and pulled her away from the door. Miyuki let out a little scream as she was propelled across the room backward. The back of her knees hit something and she fell over onto her back. Fortunately, the surface was soft and yielding and she was not hurt. Now you can't go running away like that the woman said. We have to take care of you. Miyuki tried to get up, but much like the potty seat earlier, she could not seem to move. Now, let's get you ready for your nap young lady, the woman said. The changing table Miyuki had fallen onto seemed to raise up to a higher level, making it easier for the woman to work. She stripped off Miyuki's clothing quickly and efficiently, leaving her only in her panties. What's this, the woman said pulling the panties down Miyuki's legs. You've wet these quite thoroughly. That's impossible. Miyuki said. It certainly is not, the woman said, pulling the obviously sodden garment from her legs. 
well, not to worry. She dropped the wet training panties into the diaper pail where they made a sodden thump. Then she reached under the changing table and produced a diaper. No. Miyuki almost screamed. I won't wear. Don't fuss so little girl, the woman said as she pushed a pacifier into Miyuki's mouth. Now, let's get to work. Miyuki could not spit the pacifier from her mouth and could only mumble around it. The woman produced a damp washcloth and used it to clean Miyuki up, gently running it between her legs. She then poured some baby lotion into her palms, rubbed them together and smoothed it all over Miyuki. She slid the thick cloth underneath the squirming girl. After dusting Miyuki with baby powder she pulled it up between her legs. Miyuki felt the soft, thick diaper enfolding her, pushing on her all over. The padding underneath her was like a pillow and it forced her legs apart. The woman slid a large safety pin into the folds on the right side, then the left, securing Miyuki in her diaper. There we go, she said, stepping back for a moment. She reached under the table again, removing a diaper cover. It was pink, with a teddy bear on the front. She put that on Miyuki, wrapping it around her, then snapping the six fasteners on the front clothes. Each one snapped close with a sound like a gunshot to Miyuki. Now she could feel the padding about her, and every little movement caused the diaper cover to make a soft rustling sound. The woman left Miyuki lying on the changing table for a short time while she went to one of the closets. She returned with a pink and white romper that she put on Miyuki. There we go, she picked Miyuki up and deposited her into the crib. Now you just take your nap and after that we'll bathe you, she said happily, raising the side. We'll take care of you forever. Miyuki finally managed to spit the pacifier out of her mouth. She tried to pull the romper off, but she could not unsnap it, and the material would not rip. She grabbed the bars of her crib and looked out at the departing woman. Let me out. She cried. I don't want to be here. I'm not a baby. She wailed, closing her eyes. There was a chime, and Miyuki opened her eyes. She was back in the store. Excuse me, a young woman said, sliding around Miyuki as she walked towards the counter. The old woman seemed to be waking up. What was that? Miyuki said, looking around, not sure what had happened. She shook her head, turned around, and almost ran from the store. She did not notice that attached to her briefcase with a pink ribbon was a pacifier. Cheryl Williams did not seem to know when to stop. Mrs. Potter was not a particularly strict or officious teacher and when Cheryl repeatedly criticised her approach in a history lesson, saying that she had read something that proved the opposite in a book at home, she tried to laugh the matter off. Well, we'll agree to disagree about that for the moment, Cheryl. But I assure you girls that you will do better in your A-levels if you remember my version, rather than Cheryl's. A few girls giggled. Cheryl was rather a swat and not the most popular girl in the class. But Cheryl was not prepared to let it go. Shortly before the end of the lesson, she blurted out, I am right, miss. You won't even look it up to check because you don't want to admit to the class that I'm right and you're wrong. All you know is to read from the textbook. Mrs. Potter was very angry now. It's not a question of right or wrong, Cheryl, but of respect for authority. You can stand under the clock during the break period after this lesson. Perhaps that will help you to remember that you are a pupil and I am a teacher here. Standing under the clock was a fairly common punishment at Gold Bar School for minor offences but was usually given to junior girls rather than senior girls like Cheryl. The punishment comprised having to stand in the school vestibule, hands on head, during breaks or dinner hour. 
there was a large clock on the wall there which had given the punishment its name. As the girls returned to school at the end of break or dinner they would all troop past the culprit standing in disgrace there. Cheryl's younger sister, Jackie, was a bit of a rule-breaker and the older girl had come back into school on more than one occasion to see her sister standing there in shame. Girls who had visited the headmistress's office for the slipper or cane were also often made to stand there after the whacking. It was a strict rule that no one should speak to a girl under the clock and that girls who were being punished in this way should speak to no one. Cheryl had never been sent to the headmistress nor been told to stand under the clock previously in her school career. It was a real humiliation to be made to do so now when she was 16 years old. She fell silent, already planning her revenge when she would prove to Mrs. Potter that she'd been right all along. Morning break followed the history lesson. As the rest of the girls went out onto the playground, Cheryl, having entrusted her school bag to her friend Laura, walked to the vestibule and stood in her place of shame, trying to look as dignified as possible. That was not easy, as part of the punishment involved lacing your hands together behind your head. Cheryl was the only girl standing under the clock that morning. She could hear the noise of girls having fun in the playground. Nearly all of the girls were outside now but teachers walked past her and she saw them cast disdaining or surprised glances in her direction as they saw her standing there. She could see the door to the headmistress's office, slightly down a short corridor, out of the corner of her eye. She hoped the door wouldn't open. Cheryl remembered how her friend Natalie had ended up getting the cane three years earlier. Natalie had been told to stand under the clock after she had sworn at the RE teacher, a vicar, in front of the class. There had been three girls under the clock at the break that afternoon when the headmistress came out and asked them why they were there. That had not been Natalie's first time under the clock and, as she described her offence, she was sure that Mrs. Hawkes had remembered the earlier times. She had told Natalie and one of the other girls to come back with her to her office, leaving the remaining girl feeling very relieved. Once at the office, Natalie had had to stand with her nose against the wall as the headmistress had caned the other girl. She was a first year and she received two strokes of the cane on her left palm. Natalie heard her yelp at each stroke and start to cry. Then it was Natalie's turn. She expected the same but after taking two stinging lashes on her left hand which, despite her best endeavours, left her as tearful as the younger girl, she was told to hold out her right hand for another two equally hard whacks. Poor Natalie had danced around the office, howling, after the fourth stroke. To add insult to injury the headmistress had also made both of the girls she'd caned come back and stand under the clock again for morning break the next day. So Cheryl had good reason to hope the headmistress did not emerge from her office. Just then the door opened. Ostrich-like, Cheryl looked away and closed her eyes. Perhaps if she couldn't see the headmistress she wouldn't be noticed. A hand tapped on her shoulder. Why are you here, Cheryl? Cheryl felt her face flush. She was terribly embarrassed to be in this situation. But she was well aware that to attempt to justify herself to the headmistress would be counterproductive. I was disrespectful to Mrs. Potter, miss. I'm sorry. Mrs. Hawkes knew that Cheryl Williams had a reputation as a normally studious and well-behaved girl. She also knew and trusted Mrs. Potter and was sure that she must have felt that the humiliation of standing under the clock would be sufficient punishment for Cheryl. Is this your first time under the clock, Cheryl? Yes, Miss Cheryl mumbled. Well, behave yourself and make sure it's your last. I don't like to see senior girls sent to stand under the clock and, if I see you here again, I will endeavour to make that clear to you. Painfully clear, is that understood? Yes, Miss Cheryl mumbled again. Very well. With that, Mrs. Hawkes turned and went back to her office, closing the door. Cheryl took several deep breaths. She had hardly dared to breathe for the past minute. She twisted round slightly and glanced at the clock, just above her. Half the break time had gone. Only a few minutes more. In the playground, one of Jackie's friends was giving her the news. Your sister's standing under the clock, Jackie. She looked miserable as sin. I bet she's had the cane, senior girls aren't sent under the clock otherwise. 
Are you sure, Lisa? It was really Cheryl. I'm sure. I know Cheryl, don't I? She looked like she was about to burst into tears. Jackie could hardly believe it. Cheryl had given her a hard time when she'd been made to stand under the clock. Could her big sister really have got the cane? She had to find out. Jackie left Lisa and walked back into the school. As soon as she walked into the vestibule she saw that Lisa had told her the truth. Her big sister Cheryl was standing there, under the clock, with her hands behind her head. Jackie laughed. Cheryl hadn't seen her until then. She looked in her direction and blushed deeply. Hi, Cheryl. Have you been a naughty girl? Cheryl was mindful of the no-talking rule and didn't reply. But her younger sister continued. Did you get the cane? Show me your hands. Cheryl glared at Jackie but she continued to tease her, almost capering in her schadenfreude to have found her sister in such a scrape. The door to Mrs. Hawke's office opened again just as Cheryl, her patience finally at an end, hissed go away, to her sister. Jackie saw the headmistress start to come out and decided that she should make a rapid exit. She turned and started to walk quickly away. But it was too late. Stand still, Jacqueline Williams. I see you. Jackie stopped in her tracks. The headmistress walked slowly towards the two schoolgirls. She walked round in front of Cheryl and beckoned Jackie to stand beside her sister. You know the rule about not speaking to a girl under the clock, Jackie. You've been there a few times yourself, I think. Yes, miss, Jackie admitted. But I was so surprised to see Cheryl there. I was just going out. Mrs. Hawkes turned to the older girl, still red-faced with her hands fidgeting slightly behind her head. And you, Cheryl. I let you off lightly earlier. You knew the rule too. Yes, miss, but I didn't talk to her. She was teasing me. I heard you say something to her as I came out, Cheryl. Don't. Lie. To. Me. The headmistress leaned down and lifted Cheryl's grey school skirt slightly, punctuating the last four words with four smarting slaps to the girl's right thigh. Jackie watched open-mouthed as her big sister began to cry silently. The headmistress straightened and stepped back. Put your hands behind your head, Jackie. Both of you wait here. She walked back to her office. Cheryl's thigh felt as if it was on fire, she couldn't believe how much the headmistress' hand had stung. She glared down at her sister, sniffing back tears. Jackie did not return her look but gazed at the floor. Both girls expected the headmistress to be carrying a cane when she returned. She was gone less than a minute but when she came back she was holding a large white lace-up plimsoll, without the laces. You first, Jackie. Turn around and bend over. Jackie did not argue. She turned her back to the headmistress and leaned forward grasping her legs below her knees, her blue skirt tautening over her bottom. Cheryl shuffled herself slightly to one side. Stay in that position until I tell you to stand up, Jacqueline. The headmistress grasped the plimsoll firmly by its heel end. She drew her arm back, raising it slightly, and then suddenly slammed the plimsoll forward so that the flexible sole slapped hard across the tightly stretched school skirt with a loud report. Cheryl was very aware of her smarting thigh where the headmistress had slapped her. It hadn't seemed to her that the headmistress had used much force with the slipper but from the loud noise of the slipper contacting her sister's rear and the way the blue material had dented in under the impact she was realised that the slipper was likely to be hurting Jackie even more than she had been hurt by those stinging slaps. Cheryl knew it was her turn next and her face wrinkled and she bit her lower lip in apprehension. Another whack followed, equally hard and aimed to the same place. This time Cheryl heard her younger sister make a sort of gasp as the sting bit home. There was a short pause now and the headmistress and the both, with very different feelings. Finally, the headmistress raised the plimsoll again and whacked it down hard, slightly twisting her body as she did so. It hadn't seemed to Cheryl that any extra force was used but the sound as the slipper smacked across her sister's bottom was markedly louder. 
Jackie's entire body squirmed and Cheryl thought for a moment that she was going to stand up but she managed to stay in position, wriggling slightly from side to side. There was a faint sound of whimpering. Almost as soon as it was clear that Jackie was going to remain in her bent-over position, the headmistress unleashed her fourth slipper whack, very similar to its predecessor. Jackie yelped and hopped from one foot to the other, but continued to grasp her legs below the knees. Mrs. Hawkes watched her, impassively. Cheryl and, rather more urgently, Jackie wondered if the headmistress would continue the slippering. But, after a few seconds' pause, she leaned slightly forward to touch Jackie on her shirt and told the girl to stand up. Jackie clenched her fists as she stood up, to resist the temptation to rub her sore bottom. As she turned to face the headmistress, Cheryl saw that she was on the point of tears, her blue eyes large and wet. I hope that that will serve as a reminder not to talk to girls under the clock, Jacqueline, said the headmistress. Yes, miss, I'm sorry. Jackie's voice was ever so slightly more highly pitched than normal. Very well. Put your hands behind your head and stand still while I deal with this elder sister of yours. The headmistress turned to face Cheryl. Cheryl, her hands still behind her head, hoping against hope that she would be treated more leniently than her younger sister, after all she hadn't wanted to talk at all, she'd been trying to get rid of her. I regard your behaviour as deserving of more severe punishment than I have administered to your sister, began the headmistress, causing Cheryl's stomach to perform a somersault. You are the pupil already under punishment and I could, and perhaps should, have caned you earlier for your original offence. How has my leniency been repaid? You are the elder sister and should be protecting your younger sister, but instead, you have been the cause of punishment for her. All that you had to do to fulfil the conditions of your punishment was to stand here silently, and you couldn't do that. You admitted to me that you knew the rule, so you deliberately disobeyed it. As I have slippered your sister, I will slipper you as well but you will receive six whacks, not four and they will be applied to the seat of your knickers rather than over your skirt. Cheryl blanched. Unlike her younger sister, she had never before been slippered at school and she had been shocked at the severity of Jackie's slippering. But now it seemed that her own punishment would be even more severe. The two girls were so intent on Mrs. Hawkes that they hadn't noticed that they had attracted a small, but select, audience. Although the pupils were all out on the playground, most of the teachers were still inside the school building and those of them in the staff room had clearly heard the impacts of the plimsoll across Jacqueline Williams' rear. A few of them had wandered out to see which naughty girl was being slippered. Those who knew Cheryl were shocked to see that the well-regarded senior girl was clearly about to benefit from the headmistress' expertise with the plimsoll. Mrs. Hawkes ignored the watching teachers and Cheryl wasn't even aware of them. I want you to roll your skirt up, Cheryl, and tuck the hem into your waistband to keep it out of the way. Cheryl obeyed. It was a physical relief for her hands to be moved from behind her head but she was aware of how vulnerable to the slipper her bottom would be without her skirt. She had no choice but to obey, however, and she did so. Jackie, her own bottom still smarting madly, watched as her elder sister rolled up her grey sixth form uniform skirt, revealing a tiny pair of white cotton panties. The younger girl could not help smiling, she knew Cheryl would regret not having worn her usual school knickers that day. The headmistress said nothing, however, but smiled humorlessly. Sixth form girls were allowed to choose their own underwear but she didn't think that these particular panties would provide much protection. Bend forward, like Jacqueline did, Cheryl, and grasp your legs as low down as you can below the knees and stay like that until I tell you to get up. The teenager obeyed and Mrs. Hawkes walked round behind her. Cheryl was a slender and attractive young lady. Nevertheless, unlike her younger sister, Cheryl's mature, womanly backside was too ample to be covered by one blow from the plimsoll. The headmistress realised that this time she would have to aim the wax separately at the left and right bottom cheeks in order to have full effect. She gripped the plimsoll tightly and then raised it, higher than she had when slippering Jackie. This time she took a couple of steps back first and then brought the slipper down with all her might across Cheryl's left buttock. As she did so she moved forward sharply, twisting her body tightly in an exaggeration of the move she had used for the last two whacks of Jackie's slippering. 
The flexible rubber sole of the slipper collided with full force across Cheryl's practically unprotected left bottom cheek. Despite the fact that Jackie's slippering had been across her tightly stretched skirt and that the plimsoll was now landing on flesh either wholly unprotected or covered by a tiny bit of vanishingly thin cotton material, the force of the impact was such that there was a noise like an exploding firework as the plimsoll hit its target. Cheryl yelled and involuntarily took a couple of steps forward before recovering her balance. She moaned deeply but stayed bent over, taking rapid deep breaths. A dark pink oval now appeared imprinted in the center of Cheryl's left buttock. Jackie looked on open-mouthed. She could actually see the marks of the plimsoll's tread on her sister's bottom. Mrs. Hawkes stepped back again and whacked the slipper down as she had before, but this time across the schoolgirl's right bottom cheek. Cheryl was more ready this time and managed to stay in place, though she yelped aloud. She was still breathing rapidly and sounded close to tears. The headmistress paused for a while before the next whack, regarding the jiggling bottom of the culprit. After a few seconds, she released the hardest whack yet, aiming it for Cheryl's right buttock, just where the last whack had landed. Poor Cheryl. She had been tensing herself up for a whack on the left side and she was completely taken by surprise at the sudden explosion of pain on the so recently punished right buttock. She yelled and straightened up, rubbing her outraged rear. Tears were now falling slowly down Cheryl's pretty face. Cheryl. How dare you? The headmistress took hold of Cheryl, pulling her hands away. Unless you want to come with me to my office for the cane, bend back over right now. Cheryl gave the headmistress one last pleadingly teary look and then slowly leaned forward, moaning softly as she did so, reassuming her humiliating position. Mrs. Hawkes made sure that the girl's skirt was still securely held in place, exposing the target area. Cheryl's sobs were now audible as she awaited the fourth installment of her slippering. In view of the effect of the last whack, the headmistress effectively repeated it, with another powerful smack across the right buttock on top of the previous two smacks. Cheryl yelled as the unbelievable smart in her right bottom cheek intensified once again. She forced herself to stay in position despite the pain but she was squirming now and sobbing aloud as tears dripped onto the school's parquet flooring. Mrs. Hawkes paused and regarded the penitent teen. Both buttocks now had oval marks showing the impact of the plimsoll's flexible but solid sole but the marking on the right bottom cheek was substantially larger and deeper in hue than that on the left. The headmistress was sure that Cheryl's backside would bear the bruise marks of this slippering for some time. She still wanted the last two whacks to have their full effect, though. This time as she swept forward, bringing the plimsoll swinging down, she almost crouched, delivering the whack with an underhand action to the previously unspanked undercheek of Cheryl's left buttock, the force of the blow forcing the schoolgirl onto tiptoes. Cheryl shrieked as the intense smart invaded a previously exempt area of her rear, unprotected even by her skimpy panties, but, rather unsteadily, remained in position. Without wasting any time Mrs. Hawkes repeated the action, this time whacking the plimsoll onto the delicate undercheek of Cheryl's right buttock. The plimsoll slammed into the tender flesh leaving a dark pink imprint behind close enough to the large mark already on the right cheek to merge with it within seconds. The headmistress stepped back, transferring the plimsoll to her left hand. The watching group of teachers dispersed. All right Cheryl, you can stand up, said the headmistress. Cheryl straightened and smoothed her grey skirt back into place, pressing her hands to the material as she tried to ease the imperious smart from her slippered bottom. Stand back under the clock, with your hands behind your head. You will stand there until I give you permission to leave so that the rest of the school will see you standing in disgrace as they come back in. The teacher turned to Jackie. You can go out now, Jacqueline and rejoin your classmates. Jackie gave what was intended to be an encouraging smile to her elder sister and walked to the door. Her bottom was no longer stinging badly but she was going to be feeling the effects of her slippering for some time. I'm sorry that that was necessary, Cheryl, the headmistress said and she walked back to her office carrying the slipper and the door closed after her. It was only a minute or two before the bell went for the end of the break. Poor Cheryl had to stand in that place of shame as the rest of the school trooped by. 
Once again, Cheryl emulated the fabled ostrich and closed her eyes so as not to be aware when her friends could see her there and hoping that they'd not notice her either. She had dried her tears on her sleeve and, although her face was rather flushed, she thought at least that they would not know about her humiliating slippering. She knew that she was still close to tears but was sure that the other girls would if they noticed it, attribute it just to the shamefulness of standing under the clock. No one would guess that a sixth former like her had been slippered. Finally, a couple of minutes after all the school had passed by, the headmistress came out of her room and told Cheryl that she could go back to her class. I hope that that will be a lesson to you Cheryl, to pay proper respect to your teachers and to abide by the rules of the school. Yes, miss, Cheryl mumbled through clenched teeth. The next lesson was English and Cheryl knocked on the door or the classroom, knowing that the lesson must have already begun. Before she walked in she tried to compose herself to make sure that she would not give away the fact that she'd had the slipper. She would walk normally and sit down carefully but without giving away the fact that her bottom still felt as though she'd sat down in a bowl of concentrated acid. It was bad enough that everyone knew she'd had to stand under the clock, at least she could try to keep her shameful slippering a secret. I'm sorry I'm late, sir, she said to the teacher as she entered the room. That's all right, Cheryl, he replied. We know where you've been. We've all watched you standing there as we came back into school. Cheryl grimaced at the reminder but knew that everybody must have seen her, as the teacher had said. She started to walk to her seat next to Laura who, she could see, had set her books out. But before she reached her place the teacher said, Would you like to borrow an inflatable ring before you sit down, Cheryl? Unfortunately for Cheryl the English teacher was one of those who had witnessed her slippering. Poor Cheryl blushed bright red and the whole class now guessed exactly what had happened. The three of us, Mom, my older sister Becky and I sat at the kitchen table eating dinner. Hot dogs. Baked beans. And macaroni and cheese. Mom started playing her favorite game of 20 questions. How was school? What did you do? Did you get any grades back? Do you have homework? Have you made any new friends? Every night she asked the same endless stream of questions with no pause for me to answer. Not having a chance to answer was fine because I did not want to tell her that school sucks and I have no friends. The others in school know what I am, and they let me know. I'm trailer park trash. I live in a trailer park next to the railroad tracks. Nobody wants to be friends with trailer park trash. I would never tell mom that. She works hard and she wants to do better for us. She do not always understand because she did not come from poor. She fell into poor. I believe the reason we cram around the kitchen table for dinner is so we are more like the normal families who live in houses with dining rooms. Becky interrupted, Mom in home economics class we are doing sewing. That's great dear. Do you want to know what I'm going to make? Sure. I'm making a prom dress. We can't afford that, a prom dress is costly. I know it could be expensive, but I think I will be asked to the junior prom. You're only a freshman. Yeah, but if your date is a junior you can go. Mom quit her game of 20 questions with me to play with Becky. Who's the boy? Where does he live? Why would a junior be asking a freshman to the prom? I could answer that one. Because Becky has a reputation. Boys who date Becky don't need to spank the monkey. Sewing my prom dress will save you money. You won't have to buy me one. I'm not sure I like you going out with older boys. Please, please, please. I wondered if her date would have to say please three times or just undo his zipper. You can make the dress, but pick a simple pattern with inexpensive fabric. 
but I am not saying yes to you going to the prom. I would like to meet this boy before I say yes. Thanks, Mom, you're the best. His name is James Smith, I think you already met him. Becky took a bite of her hot dog. I'm not saying this boy is, but sometimes older boys prey on younger girls, so they can. Mom glanced at me. She had my full attention. I liked watching Becky squirm. Well, just don't do anything you shouldn't. Mom. Becky did a great job on the sweet girl act. I saw an opportunity to have fun, what shouldn't she do? Mom looked at me then at Becky. She focused her attention back on me. I picked up my hot dog. I didn't lift it to my mouth. I held it just above the plate. And then I bent over and slid my mouth down the bun. I wanted to see how they handled the visual clue. Becky glared at me. I know she wanted to call me an asshole. I had half the hot dog in my mouth when Becky kicked me in the shin. I jerked, causing me to gag on the hot dog. Which I coughed into my plate. My food going all over the table. Bobby. Mom scolded me, how many times have I told you not to stuff your mouth full of food? Still coughing a bit. I eyed Becky. You're going to clean the mess you made. I'm sorry mom. Mom since Bobby has to clean the mess he made, can you take me shopping for fabric and a pattern? I didn't plan on doing that tonight, can't it wait? Becky slumped in the chair. I guess. It's just that a prom dress could take me some time to sew. But if you're too busy I understand. I just wanted to do my best and get a good grade. Becky was good at making mom feel guilty. What about your homework? is it all done? I asked. Is your homework done? Mom asked Becky. All except math, but that won't take me long. Mom looked at me, what about you, is your homework done? All done, I answered with pride. Good boy. Since Bobby is done with his homework he can do the dishes, Becky stated. You can do your homework while I clean, I wanted to flip her off. That is a good idea. Mom said standing up. Becky gave me a dirty look, will you take me shopping after I'm done with my homework, please? First get your homework done, and then I'll see. I cleaned while Becky went to her room to do her homework and Mom took a load of laundry over to the laundry house. Hey dweeb, where's Mom? I ignored her. Where is Mom? She asked louder. I shrugged, she left. What? Where did she go? She promised. Just then, Mom walked in carrying the empty laundry basket. You're an ass, Becky told me. What was that? Mom asked. I'm done with my homework. Can we go now? I just put a load in the washer. I could see that Becky didn't like hearing that. When she looked at me I smiled. She didn't always have get her way. It was obvious that she was aggravated. But Becky hated to lose. Since Bobby has his homework done, he can take care of the laundry. We can go later, Mom avoided being a referee. You promised. I finished my homework as you asked. Mom took a deep breath before looking at me. I didn't say anything, I shrugged, whatever. Okay, Mom set the empty basket on the sofa. Bobby you will need to check the machine in 20 minutes. Here are the two quarters for the dryer. She set the quarters on the counter. Turn the dial to medium heat. Sure, mom, as soon as I'm done with the dishes. I'm sorry Bobby we won't be long. And don't forget. Becky felt the need to add her, supposed, authority. Mom grabbed the car keys. We should be back in an hour. If not you will have to get the clothes out of the dryer, but we should be back. After washing the dishes I watched television. I waited past the twenty minutes. Hoping they would return. Reluctantly, I took care of the laundry. It was embarrassing to unload the washer. As the load of laundry was Mom's and Becky's undergarments. I was thankful that no one else was in the laundry house. 
I waited an hour for them to return before going back to retrieve their underwear from the dryer. I felt like a pervert sneaking into the laundry house to collect their delicates. Mom and Becky were gone for close to two hours before they finally returned. They walked in all happy and joking. As usual, Becky got way. That took longer than you said, I whined. I'm sorry, I really thought we would be home sooner. Quit whining, it's not like you had any plans. Becky retorted, then added. Did you remember to get the laundry, or is it still sitting in the washer? I took care of the laundry. After I finished washing the dishes. And cleaning the kitchen. While you were shopping. She is such a princess lazy ass. Thank you Bobby. You're a good son. So what did you do with it? You probably didn't fold or put it away. Becky. Mom obviously didn't like her tone. I put the basket on your bed, for you to fold. That figures, Becky pushed by me. That is enough, apologize to your brother. Apologize. Becky stood with her mouth agape, what for, he's the one. Apologies now and then go take care of the laundry, mom held her hand up to ward off any rebuffs. Now. Sorry, thinking what a dweeb. Becky carried her packages back to her bedroom. When she saw the basket of lingerie she was glad that the little dweeb had not touched her things. As she folded and piled the lingerie a wicked thought came to her. She was going to have fun with the little dweeb, soon to be pervert. Becky felt the need to tarnish the halo on mom's little angel. Two days had passed. Becky could not wait any longer. She went to her mother to ask for a dress form and to plant the seed. She was going to enjoy watching her little scheme grow and her brother squirm. Mom I need a dress form to sew my dress. We don't have one dear. Can you buy me one? I don't know, they are expensive. Maybe somebody at work has one I could borrow. That will work. Thanks mom. Becky stood in silence for a second, then asked the question. Mom, have you seen the pink bra and panty set that you bought me last month? You know, the one with lace trim. It's not in your drawer? No, I thought they would have been washed. But they weren't in the basket the other night, Becky stated. Mrs. Strykler thought about the other night. She remembered putting the set in the washer. They just can't disappear? I'm sure they will show up. Becky walked away smiling. Visualizing Bobby pleading to be believed. The next day Mrs. Strykler went into Bobby's bedroom. The disappearance of the panties and bra nagged at her. She was positive that she put them in the washer. If Becky had not folded them, then Bobby had lost them or he. She didn't want to think that, but the thought had been troubling her all day. She would have never contemplated Bobby taking the panties except the way he slid the hot dog in his mouth. She started her search of Bobby's bedroom in his drawers. After she found nothing there she looked in the closet. The room was tiny, there were not many places to hide something. She looked at the bed. She slid her hand between the mattresses. She froze when her hand came across the panties. She reached in and pulled out the pink bra and panty. She flopped on Bobby's bed holding the lingerie in her hand. She sat there staring at them. She had hoped that she would not find them. Now that she had, she was unsure what she should do next. She wondered how it was possible. Her baby was only twelve, he was too young to be gay. That night Mrs. Strykler called her older sister Monica. She had always wished and hoped that Bobby and Becky would have the relationship that she and her sister had growing up. They were best friends growing up. They didn't bicker constantly like Bobby and Becky. Hi sis. Hi, Monica was glad to hear from her little sister. Linda started the conversation with the small talk, and the basic events of the family. She was hesitant to mention Bobby and the panties. Monica knew when her little sister was bothered by something. Linda was glad that she was asked what was wrong. She told her older sister about finding the lingerie under her son's mattress. She told her about how sometimes she thought Becky was in her things. Now she was wondering if it was Bobby. 
The two spoke for some time. What do you think I should do? Linda asked. It could just be a phase. That is what I am hoping. Have you talked to him? Not yet. That is why I called, to get your opinion and advice. I watched a show about boys who like to wear girls' clothes. It isn't that uncommon. It wasn't that guy in the morning with the weird people. No it was that doctor guy in the afternoon. Oh, he is good, I like him. What did he have to say? Be supportive, it is very important that Bobby knows he is loved. Thanks, sis, I knew you would help. They talked for a few more minutes before hanging up. She loved her son and he should know that. She wondered, did he? He had been quiet and withdrawn lately. She had worried that he was becoming depressed. That night Mrs. Streicheler came to a resolution. Her only concern was how Becky would react. Becky was surprised by her mom's suggestion that Bobby should be her dress form. She did not want him near any of her stuff, let alone her prom dress. She was certain that her mother did not try very hard to borrow a dress form. She was about to complain when her mother produced the pink bra and panty set. Becky did an excellent job of acting shocked when Mrs. Streicheler explained where she found the lingerie. Becky understood what her mother was doing. She wanted to laugh. This was better than she had hoped. Do you think he is gay? Becky asked. She had always thought him quiet, but not in that way. I don't know. Mrs. Streicheler tried not to sound negative. Well if he wants the panty and bra he can have them, Becky started thinking of other things she could get him to wear. Mrs. Streicheler hugged Becky. Bobby is lucky to have such an understanding and loving sister. You're kidding. I could not believe what mom was asking. No I'm not. It will save us money and you will be helping your sister. Mom I can't wear a dress. It's not like you will be wearing it. You will just be fitting it. But I can't. Why not? I'm a boy. Mrs. Streicheler thought Bobby would have jumped at the chance to wear the dress. Not only was he being given permission. It was her idea. She wondered if she misjudged the situation. The way he was acting she had doubts about her decision. I told you he wouldn't help me, Becky stated flatly. He only thinks of himself. No, I don't, I retorted, you're the selfish one. Then you'll do it? Mom asked. Do I have to? Yes. I guess, but she can't tell anyone. If kids in school find out, I'll be beat up. Mom assured me, she won't tell anyone. I promise, Becky said, thinking, the hell I won't. You'll find a bra and panty set in your top drawer. Mrs. Streicheler could tell by Bobby's expression he did not understand her statement. You will need to wear them. What? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Why? You need to be as close to Becky's shape as I can make you. Mom. Must I? Yes. I went to my bedroom. In my top drawer was the pink bra and panty set. I remembered them from the other night. They were very soft. The other night when I took them out of the dryer I wondered what they would be like to wear. Now, I was about to find out. I striped out of my clothes and held the panty up, uncertain about putting them on. It was strange. I was drawn to them yet afraid to wear them. There was something appealing and comforting about the lingerie. Having those feelings was scary. What would it mean if I wore them? Slowly I stepped into the panty. The way the elastic hugged my buns and the smoothness of the fabric was an incredible sensation. Tantalized, I rubbed my hands over my bottom, and then suddenly became embarrassed that I was enjoying wearing the panties. My fear of deriving pleasure from lingerie had been realized. I held the bra in front of my chest. It was a strange and sexy garment. I turned it around while studying the intricate lace. I had never seen Mom or Becky put one on, so it was not clear to me how one was slipped on. I was confident you did not step into it, 
so I tried hooking it and slipping it over my head without success. Finally, I wrapped it around my waist and hooked it, and then I turned it around my waist and pulled it into place. It was difficult to slip my arms through the straps while trying to pull it up. There is an easier way to do that, Mom stood in my doorway. I jumped. Mom, embarrassed I tried covering my chest and crotch. Don't worry. Mom, this isn't funny. I'm sorry, she turned around, put your pants on then I'll fix your bra. It's not my bra, I mumbled while I rushed to get my pants on. Are your pants on? Yes. When I put my bra on I just slip my arms through the straps and then reach behind to hook the clasp. Mom illustrated for me as she explained the process. Thanks mom, but I won't be wearing a bra after tonight. Bobby it will take weeks for Becky to sew her dress. Weeks? When I agreed to do help I thought it was just tonight. No, dear. It takes time to sew a dress. Put your top on then come to my bedroom. I don't know if I can do this. You agreed to it, you have to, mom turned and left my room. I pulled my white t-shirt on. When I looked in the mirror I could see the pink bra through the t-shirt. I felt a tinge of gratification and pride. Part of me felt the need to stop, to go back, but there was no going back. I headed for mom's room. The distance to her bedroom was short, but that short walk was unforgettable. I could not believe how sensuous Becky's panties felt as I walked. I was aware of my every movement. I felt giddy. Again, part of me worried about enjoying wearing Becky's underwear. I also became fearful when I walked past Becky. Could she tell that I was enjoying myself? I'm here, I told mom while glancing back at Becky sitting on the sofa. The way she smiled at me made me uncomfortable. Come over here, mom commanded. I cut a pair of old pantyhose to stuff with cotton balls. What for? You need breasts, you need to be the same size as Becky. I gave her a questioning expression. Don't worry I gave Becky a little help when she was twelve. Mom continued to tell me about Becky's first bra, a training bra. I did not say anything I just listened while she worked on stuffing and shaping the nylon falsy. It was strange to listen to Mom talk about Becky's first bra. Okay, let's see how this fits. Mom pulled my shirt up and placed one falsy in. After studying it for a minute, she pulled it out and stuffed in a few more cotton balls. Then she worked on making the second the same size as the first. Once she had them finished, she placed them in my bra. I don't know if I would say you're lucky or if you missed out, but you get to start out with a B cup. She stated stepping back to look at her work. Straighten your back, stand proud. I did as she asked. Becky can you come here? Mom called. Becky stopped at the door, what? Stand next to your brother, I need to see if I got the size right. Cute, Becky said, thinking I needed to get a photo of my little sissy brother. Mom reached under my shirt and pulled down on the bra. Your breasts are too high, she told me while adjusting the shoulder straps. I blushed. Next door in trailer 11, Vanessa happened to glance out the side window. She was shocked by what she saw. Bobby her neighbor and best friend, was wearing a bra, and Mrs. Strykler was adjusting the straps. What the? Vanessa muttered. What's wrong? Mrs. Kiss asked. It's Bobby. You're not going to believe me, but he is wearing a bra. Mrs. Kiss walked over to the window, so she did it. Did what? asked Vanessa. Becky needed a dress form for the prom dress she is sewing. Linda tried to borrow a form, without any luck. So she talked about having Bobby act as the form. You're kidding, why? Vanessa made the statement like poor Bobby. Bobby's thirteenth birthday is in a couple weeks. She is trying to save money to buy him that gaming station he wants. Oh, Vanessa found seeing Bobby wearing a bra intriguing. You should go over there and give him some words of encouragement. We have a quiz in Spanish tomorrow, I could go over to study. That is a good idea, but whatever you do, 
Don't giggle or laugh at him. Mom. I wouldn't do that. He's my best friend. I know, it's just the slightest bit of teasing could ruin everything. Vanessa grabbed her books and headed over to Bobby's trailer. Mom pulled my t-shirt down into place. She fussed with the breasts, squeezing them together, and then pushing on them. It was an odd having my mother shape my breasts. There, what do you think? Mom asked. They look natural on him, Becky said. I could feel that I was getting aroused, Mom I can't do this. What? I can't. Mom cut me off by putting her hand in front of my face. Bobby I am getting tired of your constant whining. I saw Becky smile. Sorry, I told Mom. I think he needs a thinner waist, I'm not fat, Becky stated. Mom defended me, Bobby is not fat. I thought myself to be nothing but skin and bones. How Becky could suggest I'm fat was unbelievable. Mom measured us, at Becky urging. Becky had a thinner waist. I could not believe she was two inches smaller. I felt fat. Suck it in tubby, Becky patted my stomach. Mom. Becky, you could be nicer, he is doing you a favor, Mom reminded her. Sorry. I froze with fear hearing a knock at the front door. It was then that I realized the curtains were open. Anybody walking by could spy me. My fear grew thinking about all the people who could have seen me. How many kids in school would know that I liked to wear my sister's panties and bra? Can you get that? Mom asked Becky. Mom. I protested, don't let her let anybody in. Hi, I heard Becky. Hi Becky, is Bobby here? It was Vanessa. Becky had heard Bobby's protest, but the situation was too perfect. Come in, Becky said stepping back, so Vanessa could see her new little sissy play friend. Bobby Vanessa is here. I whispered to Mom, I can't go out there. Can you get rid of her? As Becky stepped into the bedroom with Vanessa right behind her. I turned my back to them. I know it is stupid to try to hide in plain sight but I did not want Vanessa to see the two large bumps on my chest. Hey Bobby, do you want to study Spanish with me? Vanessa asked. I stood there in silence. I prayed for a lightning bolt to strike me down. I could not believe I let myself be talked into wearing the bra and panties. I was so embarrassed. It was all Becky's fault. So I prayed for a lightning bolt to strike her down instead. Are you wearing a bra? Vanessa asked. Neither Mom nor Becky said a word. Shit. I hated the both of them at that moment. I straightened and turned to face her. I thought, go ahead and laugh. I made him wear it, Mom came to my rescue. It's a favor for Becky. She is sewing a dress and needed a dress form. Oh, she shrugged her shoulders. I came over to see if you have time to help me study Spanish for the quiz tomorrow. That was it? Oh. I expected her to laugh at me. It was at that moment I learned that Vanessa was a true friend. I don't know. When do we do the dress thing? I asked Becky. You have time to study, Becky said, momentarily confused by Vanessa's acceptance. But don't take your bra and panties off. My face turned red. I thought, you bitch, you had to tell her I'm wearing panties. If you have a quiz tomorrow, take all the time you need, Mom said. Vanessa stepped into the living room where I followed her to the sofa. She sat in the middle forcing me to sit next to her. I felt awkward sitting next to her wearing a bra. I tried to cover my bumps with my arms. She leaned in and whispered to me in Spanish. I think that you are the best. If I had a brother I would hope he would be like you. I thanked her in Spanish. Her compliment relaxed me, however, I could not forget that I was wearing a bra and panty. After I got my Spanish notes and book, we spent the next hour studying. We decided to only speak in Spanish. Often on during our studying, Vanessa made comments to me. When she told me how great I looked, and how we could now do things like girlfriends, I wasn't sure what she meant or how I should respond. 
her acceptance was pleasantly unexpected. The giddy feeling I felt earlier returned. I didn't have the heart to tell her that it was only for a week. But I did remind her I was only doing it to help Becky. As Mrs. Streichler watched her son from the kitchen, she realized he looked different, changed, and not just because she was seeing him wearing a bra. It was his mannerisms, his high spirits. He was happy. She even heard him giggle. She could not remember the last time he was happy. She imagined him wearing a dress, with his long black hair pulled back in a ponytail, laughing. The image was real. She couldn't provide many material things, but she was determined to provide a loving happy environment. This is a true story, this is how mom come to know about my transsexuality. It is 1969 and I am living with my mom in Sweden. Summer was going down the drain it had rained almost every other day and my 10-week summer holiday was soon coming to an end. Like so many other mornings I took my bike and rode to the beach not far from the village where I lived. There I used to stay in one of the old changing huts reading a book or magazine or to just be alone. To my mum I used to say that I was going to be with a friend and that I would be home in time for supper. But the truth was I had no friends and wanted no one. I want to be alone because I needed to come to terms with myself and my desire to be a girl instead of a boy. For many years I had felt this longing of being a girl. It had made me do things that had made my classmates rather suspicious of me and they had begun teasing me. Calling me all sorts of names including sissy. Even my mom had started to ask me questions like. Why had I not cut my hair like she had told me to a million times, was it because I wanted to have my hair to look like a girl? And was it me that had been in her wardrobe? I denied those accusations strongly and promised to have my hair cut but I just couldn't bring myself to go to the barber. I wanted to have curls in my hair like Madeline, the most beautiful girl in my class, the whole school even. I so envied of her and all the other girls. It made my heart ache that I was not like them but I rather plain boy that no one liked. It was drizzling then I reached the beach and I quickly locked and hid my bike in the usual place so that no one would see that there was anyone there. I had with me some food, drink and a book that I had tried to read for a whole week now. I went to my usual cabin, the one that stood apart from the others. The door had no lock on the outside but had a hasp on the inside. The cabin itself was about three foot six square and had a bench on the far side. A small window let in some light but I also had a candle and matches hidden under a loose floorboard. I saw it immediately I opened the door. Hanging on one of the pegs was a bikini that someone had forgotten. I looked up and down the beach to try and see if there was someone else. But the beach was completely deserted so I quickly sneaked inside and locked the door. With shaking hands and a hammering heart, I took the bikini from the peg. It was pink with black polka dots and had clasps that looked like brass at the sides of the panty and at the back of the bra. From the look of it, it must have been quite expensive. It was dry and in size 40 the same size mom took. That I knew from my visits to her closet. In other words a bit too large for me but even so I just had to try it on. After another quick look to see if there were anybody else in the vicinity I closed and locked the door then started to undress. Telling me this was too good to be true I put on the bikini, starting with the panty. It was then I was hooking it up that I saw that it could be adjusted in quite a simple manner by pulling on the side straps. With the panty now on and adjusted, I turned to the bra. It took me quite a while to get the back clasps to connect. I then adjusted the shoulder straps like I had seen mom do ever so often. This was only the third or perhaps fourth time I wore a bra. It felt so good, so right. 
It would have been a lie to say that I was not excited but it was no longer like the first time I wore women's clothing some two years ago. This time it was more like a confirmation of my true self. I wished there had been a mirror so I could have taken a good look at myself. Looking down at my chest I saw that the bra cups although made with some sort of stiffener underneath still looked rather empty. This was quickly solved by rolling up my socks, one in each cup. To this day I still do not know what drove me to leave the cabin. It had stopped raining and it looked like there might even be a bit of sunshine. The beach was still empty so I decided to take a quick dip in the sea. The water wasn't exactly warm but not too cold either. When I got out of the water I realised that I had no towel to dry myself with. This was not a great problem since now the sun had finally broken through the clouds and the temperature was quickly rising. Becoming rather bold I decided to take a stroll along the still deserted beach. I should have known it was a bad idea but I just had to do it and I walked too far and therefore missed hearing the first car. When I finally returned the beach wasn't exactly full of people but there were far too many to make it possible for me to get back into the cabin unseen. All I could do was to hide behind some bushes and hope that no one stole my clothes in the meantime and that it would soon be possible for me to get to the cabin. Time dragged on and on and on and still more people come to the beach. The sun now shone from an almost cloudless sky. Several times I feared I might get spotted especially then two of my classmates suddenly come running by but luckily they there too busy chasing each other to see me there I was hiding. Yes, I told myself it had been too good to be true. Now I was almost certain to be found out and the ridiculing would never stop. I cursed myself. I shouldn't have left the cabin, I ought to have known this could happen. It was very late in the evening then I finally dared to live my hiding place and make a quick desperate dash to the cabin. All my clothes were still there so I changed into them in a hurry. My heart was pounding like mad in my chest. The bikini was completely dry by now so I decided to bring it with me. It was such a good find that I just couldn't give it up any matter what. My greatest worry by now was what to tell mom. I should have been home hours ago. Just as I had expected mom was beside herself from worrying over what could have happened to me. When I got home and found her in the kitchen. I told her the story I had rehearsed on my way back that I and my pal had been too carried away building a raft that we had totally forgotten about time. Mom told me that she had been in contact with all of my mates. They had all told her that I had not been with them for ages. So where had I been? I quickly realised that I had to give her a story that was as close to the truth as I could without telling her the truth. So I told her that I had been alone at the beach to think about things like school and some of the things that some of my classmates had done to me. They thought I was a sissy and then I had fallen asleep by the warmth of the sun and that I had only awoken then it had gotten colder. Mom was still sceptical but I stuck to my new story. After I had eaten my now completely dry supper Mom sent me to bed. She informed me that we would have to talk more about this tomorrow. I went upstairs and into my room with the bikini still hidden in my jeans jacket. I quickly undressed and went to the bathroom to take my usual shower before bed. I heard mom come upstairs but thought nothing of it. Suddenly mom burst into the bathroom, the bikini in her hand. Demanding to know what it was doing in my jeans jacket. Chocked by the sudden change in the events I desperately stammered something that I had found it on the ground. Before I had finished mom yanked me out of the shower and pointed to my chest. You wore it. She screamed and slapped me in my face with the bikini. I screamed, no but mom just turned me around so I could see myself in the bathroom mirror. The truth was plain to see, my chest and hips bore the distinct outline of the bikini. I had simply been too long in the summer Sunday. That night I told mom between sobs and streams of tears of my transsexuality although I didn't have that word at the time. Mom took me to several doctors in the vain hope they could cure me. However, instead, they all told her and me there is no cure. They went on to tell her to make the best you can of the situation. This was something mom found very hard to accept.
Aunt May and Simone are back at home after the shopping trip to town. The new baby food groceries are put in the pantry. It does not take long before Aunt May fixes a baby bottle of warm formula for Simone to drink for lunch. You had a big breakfast baby Simone, Aunt May said, this bottle of formula will be your lunch. While still in his cute yellow dress Simon is picked up and put on Aunt May's lap. She is sitting on the couch as the baby bottle nipple is placed in Simone's mouth. Unfortunately for Simon May is loving all of this. She is thrilled to have a baby girl in the house. Drink it all up sweetie, Aunt May said. You'll get used to the taste. It takes 15 minutes to drink the baby bottle of formula. Simone is soon given another one to drink. By the time she finishes the second baby bottle, Simone has wet her diaper again. There is a knock at the front door, no one is expected. Hello mother, I am off this afternoon and had to come by and see how my bedwetting cousin Simon is doing, cousin Sarah said coming inside. Oh my goodness, you mean Simone not Simon, May replied smiling. Sarah comes in to find Simon in his yellow dress, tights, plastic panties, and diapers. She is thrilled to see what her mother has done to Simon. Sarah left the other day not knowing how things progressed afterward. I see mother took my advice and is using my old diapers and clothing for you to become a baby girl, Sarah teased Simon. You did put the diapers on by yourself the first time. The way things happened both Sarah and her mother may are convinced Simon diapered up because he is a bedwetter. Why else would he have done this? He did take Sarah's things without permission. Now Sarah is happy to let Simone be dressed in her old diapers, plastic panties, and clothing. Sarah has not wet the bed for years and her old stuff is being put to good use. I am wondering if his mother knows about Simon's accidents, Sarah said. I did not call her yet to see if she found wet spots on his sheets, May explained. For now I will keep Simone diapered day and night. I bet you are loving this Simon, Sarah teased. You get to wear diapers and girls' clothing during the day too. I was not given any choice, Simone explained. Your mother spanked me the other day and put a clean diaper on afterward. The next thing I know is she is dressing me like a baby girl. You either wet the bed and should stay diapered, Sally concluded, or you simply like wearing diapers and plastic pants for some reason. Both of these options are embarrassing for Simon. What can he do? Either way, he ends up diapered both day and night. Simon does not want to admit he loved the idea of being diapered again at his age. He also doesn't want to admit he loves being dressed as a baby girl. Simon certainly does not want to admit to being a bedwetter when he is not. Explanations are no longer needed or wanted by Aunt May. She is sure Simon will continue to be punished this way for a full month. At this time Simone is wearing a wet diaper that still needs to be changed. Come here sweetie and let me see if your diaper is wet, Sarah insisted. Simone is grabbed by the hand and pulled toward cousin Sarah. She pushes on his bottom and hears a wet squishy sound. He is wet for sure and cousin Sarah wants to change Simone's diaper. Take her to the bedroom where I put your old crib back together, May said, you can change our baby girl. I don't want my cousin Sarah changing my diaper Aunt May, Simon said. Sarah scoops Simone up in her arms and carries him to the bedroom. The crib sides are down with a diaper mat on the bed. Sarah lays Simon on the diaper mat and takes off her shoes. Simone's tights are taken off along with the girl's lacy socks. Her yellow plastic panties are removed next and then the diaper is untapped. Stop this and leave me alone, Simone insisted, I am not a baby. Cousin Sarah ignores him completely as she washes Simone's diaper area with large baby wipes. He is not happy about this forced babying. Simon did not want to become a baby girl. Do not resist me in any way or I will put you over my knee, Sarah said. With that comment, Simone calms down again. Sarah is applying diaper rash cream and baby powder to Samantha's diaper area. Sarah knows the pink edge cloth diapers made her feel very babyish. She decides to put Simone in night diapers this afternoon. 
Lay still baby while I get some cloth diapers with the pinked edges, Sarah insisted getting four diapers off the shelf. I will do like mommy used to do for me and make a thick diaper, Sarah said folding each diaper in half and then stacking them. I don't need a night diaper during the day, Samantha insisted. Sarah grabs both ankles and lifts Samantha's bottom. She puts the stack of diapers in place. Sarah has done babysitting in the past and has experience in diapering older kids. The pink edge cloth diaper is pulled up between Simon's legs and pinned on tightly. I used four locking diaper pins like mommy used to use on me, Sarah said. Lay still while I get some pink plastic panties. I think you should be put in a pink nightgown for the rest of the day. The pink nightgown Sarah has in mind is the one Simone has already worn. The nightgown is for a little girl and is very short. The nightgown has short puffy sleeves and an empire waist. The pink nightgown has lace on the sleeves, around the rounded neck, and at the hem on the bottom. With Simone already diapered and wearing pink plastic panties cousin Sarah puts her old pink nightgown on Simone. She gets to wear pink socks with white lace to keep her feet warm. It is only late afternoon but Sarah has put her cousin Simon in night diapers. You are cute in my old pink little girl's nightgown, Sarah said. It is good that you are a small man. It is not good for me since I am being dominated, Simon replied shyly. We will be staying home for the rest of the day, May said. Do you have to work later Sarah? I managed to get this afternoon off and I was not scheduled this evening, Sarah replied to Mom. May decides to have Sarah stay for dinner which is only two hours away. Both ladies go to the kitchen and leave Simone in the living room to watch a few cartoons. May decides to put a ham in the oven and Sarah cuts up a tossed salad. Will baby Simone be having dinner with us? Sarah asked after seeing the baby food in the pantry. Yes since lunch was only a baby bottle of formula, mother replied. The baby food will be used but not tonight. Sally sees the two pack of pacifiers and washes them both. She wants to give her cousin Simon a pacifier. Sarah takes one to the living room to surprise Simone. Close your eyes and open your mouth baby Simone, Sarah said. Simone cooperates thinking this is a snack of some kind. Cousin Sarah puts the pacifier in his mouth and has Simone close her mouth. She tells Simone to use this and relax like a baby girl. A pink ribbon is tied to the pacifier so it can be worn around the neck. I did not think you were going to give me a pacifier, Simon complained. He puts it back in his mouth and continues to watch television. Simone is hungry and is told what is being fixed for dinner. The ham is covered with pineapple and cherries for added flavor. Mom puts it in the oven with potatoes wrapped in aluminum foil. Dinner will be ready in an hour and a half, Mom tells the others. I made a large salad and put it in the refrigerator, Sarah commented. Meanwhile back in Macon, Georgia Simon's mom and dad are keeping busy at work. They are glad Simon is helping his Aunt May by staying with her. They would be surprised to know what has happened since Simon has not wet the bed since he was five. The parents are also enjoying a little time alone with Simon being gone. They can do more without having to plan meals for their son every day. John took Joyce out to dinner a couple of times this week. The parents are glad Simon will have a job in September. Uncle Jack is working lots of hours while being out of town for a month. He will be getting big paychecks. Jack is grateful to have Simon come and stay with his Aunt May. Back at the home in Griffin, Georgia the table is being set for dinner. The baked ham smells great and all are hungry. Simone is told to help set the table and does this. Her night diaper is thick and makes her waddle as she walks. Aunt May and cousin Sarah think this is cute. You even walk like a baby girl in that night diaper, cousin Sarah said. Dinner is enjoyed at the table around 6 p.m. The family sits in the dining room for a dinner like this. Cold iced tea is served in a glass with ice cubes. Simone has hers given to her in a sippy cup instead. I will have to go home after dinner mother and do some chores around my condominium, Sarah said at dinner. I don't get much time off. 
Simone is glad to hear this, he would not want cousin Sarah giving him a bath or changing his diapers again. Simone will have to take another bubble bath tonight. Her hair will not need washing and will retain the curls another day. I will be giving you a bath at 7pm again tonight, Aunt May said. You can go play until then. Simone ends up watching television again, this time the evening news. The ladies clean up the kitchen as Simone relaxes watching TV. She avoids more chores this evening. Simon will still have to cut the grass on Saturdays. He wonders if this will be done as a girl wearing a diaper. It is Wednesday so that is not something to worry about yet. After dinner and clean up Sarah says goodbye and goes back home. She hugs mom and cousin Simone before leaving. I will get you bath ready, Aunt May said, go to the bedroom and I will come in and undress you. Simone obeys like a good girl and goes back to the bedroom. The tub is filling when Aunt May comes in and takes off the nightgown Simon is wearing. He lays down on the diaper mat to have the plastic panties and cloth diapers taken off. I see these are wet and will put them in the diaper pail. Aunt May said. Follow me to the bathroom sweetie. Simone is bathed by Aunt May and dried with a fluffy white towel. Thank you. Or should I say thank you for watching?